Welcome to another episode of the Film Florida podcast. My name is John Lux, and I'm the executive director of Film Florida. Thanks for downloading this episode of the podcast. Before I introduce you to our guests, remember to subscribe, rate, and review the Film Florida podcast. If you're not already a member, please consider joining Film Florida at filmflorida.org. Finally, we have a Film Florida merchandise page. Check it out at teespring.com slash stores slash Film Florida to purchase Film Florida t-shirts, sweatshirts, coffee mugs, and now protective masks as well. Todd Thompson is a writer, producer, and director, and Joy Keegan is an actress, writer, and producer. Both are Central Florida-based, and they're working on a historical Florida story. Today we talk to each of them about the Highwaymen. What's the story? What attracted them to it? The challenges COVID-19 is playing on the production? And when we'll see the results? Here's my conversation with Todd Thompson and Joy Keegan. Todd and Joy, uh, I'd like to start with your backstory. If we could tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Todd, you go first. Well, I'm uh, born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio. I um, graduated from University of Akron with a marketing and advertising degree, I think. It's been a long time. <laughs> but um, I, uh, I, I quickly moved down to Florida um, to work with Disney. I had a 21-year run with Disney, uh, directing and producing um, in their marketing department, ironically enough. But uh yeah, it was fun. And, and, you know, the whole time I've, I've been a storyteller at heart. I, I've been making movies since I was a little kid and uh, since Star Wars came out basically. And just um, always had a love and an appreciation for the art form. I mean, I, I, I really gravitate towards books. I gravitate towards plays and music, but movies really, really grabbed me and um, just feel really blessed and fortunate to be a full-time filmmaker these days. Enjoy. How about you? Yeah, so I grew up doing theater as an actor and um, was just love the stage, kind of feel more comfortable there uh, than anywhere else. Um, and then when I went off to college, I started with a public relations degree and then ended up finalizing uh, with a business degree um, with a theater minor and just sort of doing that. But I was trying to compromise and do the thing that would allow me to definitely have a nice steady paying job, but still maybe work with people. <laughs> and I hated it. <laughs> it, no, I um, I just realized this is really what I, where I want to be. Uh, this industry, it's always called to me. And so thankfully, um, when I was young enough to still sort of make that transition, I happened upon this gentleman named Todd Thompson. <laughs> he thankfully uh, introduced me to the world of film, frankly, because um, I was able to work in one of his original, one of his um, short films. And, um, and that was a really life-changing experience because I'd never done film and TV before. And I uh, realized how much I needed to learn after doing that. So I went and I, I studied and, and, and um, thankfully have become a working actor. And, but because of the business degree and all the work experience on the side that I've sort of been you know, cultivating over the years, um, he pulled me aside and he said, look, I think you would be a great producer. And so here we are today um, producing. And so yeah, I recognize that like left and right brain thing that I happen to yeah. have myself. So I was like, oh, I know, I know that. <laughs> but we, we actually met on the stage, right? Like we uh, did, we did. Orlando yeah, Film Fest or Orlando Fringe Festival. It was a show that we did together. It's a wonderful life. Yeah. And Joy, you mentioned the acting side of things. And when I look at your credits, there's some recognizable titles there. So where have people maybe seen you on screen? Well, you know, one of the cool things about being an actor in the Southeast is that you get these incredible opportunities to really hone your skills and sort of cut your teeth in smaller roles. So I have this wonderful little list of roles with House of Cards, The Resident, uh, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt was a really fun one, obviously. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, Mr. Mercedes, one of my very favorite roles um, was really, really cool. But I probably am most known for a Nickelodeon series called I Am Frankie. I played the school principal and we were on for two seasons. And so that was a really fun series regular role. And, um, and frankly, a master class on being uh, on set as an actor uh, for long periods. Because, you know, we were there living there for about six months total. So, And Todd, before we get to the current project, which is really why we, we have you guys on, talk a little bit about some of your other titles. Um, well, I, I started off, um, I guess, like a lot of filmmakers, you're making short films, cutting my teeth, uh, you know, originally on 16 millimeter and 35 back in the day. So I, um, I, I directed and wrote, directed and produced, um, you know, a series of, uh, of titles time and again was, was one of my first, it was, uh, a film, um, that starred Seymour Cassell, the late Seymour Cassell and Margaret Bly. 
And that was a really special project for me in a lot of ways. Um, it came off of my years of volunteering at the Florida Film Festival and forming a friendship with Seymour and getting to you know work with him. It was like my first professional actor that I got a chance to really work with as a director. And then went on to other short film projects like Once Not Far From Home and um, This Man's Life, which is the project I worked on with Joy when I, when I first cast Joy. Uh, that film starred Michael Rooker and uh, Bill Cobbs. And, um, you know, a slew of other little short titles. And then for, for one reason or another, I fell into the world of documentaries, which, you know, is a genre that I really love. I got involved in a project called Woman in Motion, which goes way back to, believe it or not, 2014. And it was, it's a documentary um, about Michelle Nichols from Star Trek and what she did post-Star Trek to um, basically change the face of the space program forever, which I know is, you know, near and dear to everyone's hearts in Florida, especially. But um, that, that was a great project and it took about five years to complete and um, it'll actually be released in February 2021. So super excited about that project. And um, I find myself working on a few other music rock docs, actually. I'm doing one called Prefab, which is a pre beatles story. I'm in uh, post-production on that right now. And then um, I just started production on a rock and roll documentary about the uh, late, great Del Shannon. So, um, so yeah, things are, things are busy here. And I mentioned that the main reason I wanted to have both of you on is because of your current project, The Highwaymen. So let's start at the very beginning with that. Todd, for those that aren't familiar with what the story of The Highwaymen is, please give us a little bit of background on, on why this is so important to uh, the state of Florida. Well, I mean, The Highwaymen is this amazing story that I stumbled upon about 15 years ago, but it, it, it's truly a, a piece of Florida history that very few people know about, really. It's, it, it really, you know, in retrospect, it reminds me now of like a film like Hidden Figures, you know, which was such a great, powerful story coming out of NASA that nobody seemed to have any awareness of. But um, The Highwaymen takes us back to um, late 50s, early 60s, uh, down in Fort Pierce, Florida, with um, a high school senior named Alfred Hare, who was a, a black student attending Lincoln Park Academy. He, um, you know, he's a very athletic football star kind of guy, um, but had a, an incredible talent for painting. And he also was very fortunate to have a really incredible teacher, um, this woman named Zenobia Jefferson, who recognized his talent. And had a friendship with um, a gentleman by the name of Bean Backus, uh, who happened to be a, a pretty well-known, world-renowned landscape painter, Florida landscape artist back in the day. And he lived in Fort Pierce. And um, he lived on the other side of the tracks, but always had an open-door policy and, and had a friendship with Zenobia and said, hey, you know, anytime you want to bring your students by to see what a working artist does, what a studio looks like, you know, feel free. So she took him up on the offer and brought her class over to meet Mr. Backus and watch him in the studio. And Alfred was one of the students. And uh, Alfred and Bean Backus, you know, struck up an immediate friendship. And uh, Bean became Alfred's mentor and taught him how to paint. But, you know, being in the 1960s, seg very segregated Jim Crow South, you know, Alfred knew he would never be seen as an artist. He never would, you know, make the kind of money that Bean was making in commissions. So he took this formula for painting and took it back to Blacktown, um, his neighborhood across the tracks. And basically taught all of his friends how to paint. And what, what he couldn't do in quality, he made up for in quantity. So they would literally do 20, 30 paintings a night, maybe. And um, the next day, load the paintings, sometimes still wet, in the back of a car. And a, a team of them would just kind of drive up and down A1A and US1 and sell them out of the trunk of their car. So tourists, dentist offices, doctor's offices, banks, lawyer's offices. And they did it for, I mean, nearly a decade, you know, plus. And they produced over, I think, I think the count is over like 200,000 paintings. And Alfred always um, dreamed about becoming a millionaire. He always dreamed about driving a Cadillac. And he got the Cadillac, but um, he didn't quite make it to, uh, to, to live to be 30. He, he wanted to be a millionaire by the time he was 30. And unfortunately, he was uh, struck down when he was 29. So, so the legend lives on. But, um, but I, yeah, I discovered the story about 15 years ago. And um, it just really resonated with me as a story about perseverance and entrepreneurialism and persistence and belief in yourself. And I just found it very inspiring. So it's just a story I never gave up on. And, and besides the obvious, I mean, what pulled you into it? I mean, the highwayman has been talked about, but what, I don't know, um, made you say, this is a story that I want to tell. Well, I, I just, I mean, I just have a personal mantra that I, I really want to focus on films that enlighten mankind, you know, make the world a better place. 
I, I certainly accomplished that with Woman in Motion. It's a very incredible story about a very incredible woman. And but but even predating that, you know, when when the high woman came to me years ago, it, it just really recognized that this was a true underdog hero story about an everyman who really, you know, climbed the mountain and, and surpassed all odds despite you know the obstacles that were in front of him to to uh, make his life and the lives of all of his friends around him better. And I know this is a story you've been engaged with for a while, as you mentioned, but what have been what have been some of the challenges that you've come across in getting to this point in the storytelling process? Well, I mean, I, I think the first I think the first challenge is always, you know, financing. Um, it, it's easy. I find it very easy to, like, you know, wrangle the energy and get everyone excited about a particular project. But, you know, when the rubber really meets the road, I mean, you got to have funding for stuff like that. I'm trying to make this as a SAG ultra low budget, which is, I believe is like under $200,000 to, you know, a budget that's, you know, closer to four or 5 million. And um, it's it just really been boiled down to just the fact that it's been hard to get the funding together. We, you know, we attempted to do a, a little Kickstarter campaign for a while when that whole platform launched, we didn't get any funding from there, but we found a few angel investors along the way to keep the project alive and, you know, constantly work on the script. I mean, we've been working on this script and developing the script for, you know, a decade or more. So uh, we've had plenty of time to, to get that right. And then along the way, um, you know, one, one of the beneficial things I think about projects taking this long is um, the fact that, you know, new ideas come to you. So, you know, in, in going down this journey with these artists, it, it quickly became clear that, you know, it was going to be very difficult to really capture who they were in a two and a half hour or two hour even feature film. I love our script. I mean, we've got an incredible script and it really captures the spirit of who they are you know, we, we decided let's also do a six part documentary series because what better way to like really be able to dive into the history of that time period and who these artists were and what they were really up against. And each one of them really brought their own unique story to the table. So that's where the idea was birthed to, you know, do a six part documentary series to complement the feature and vice versa. Enjoy the story of the highwaymen is, is culturally important for Florida, as we mentioned but it's a really big story to tell. Talk about the creative process of figuring out what details of the story you want to talk about and how you go about telling those stories. So as Todd mentioned, you know, the central story is the Alfred Hare story and that when you Google the highwayman, that's what, what sort of pops up online. Um, but it's definitely more than that because there are 26 artists who were inducted into the Florida Artists Hall of Fame in 2004. And so we wanted to be able to really honor all of those artists because they're all part of that group. The documentary series allows us to do that and at great length, you know, so we get to talk about the artists, their backgrounds, what it was like growing up back then in the Jim Crow South, what their kids are going through, um, a, you know, possible second generation. There are some artists that, that are their kids that are now painting. And we also get to talk about the collectors, which is a very unique portion of this. They're not normal art collectors. So I'm very excited about that element of it. And I'll kind of leave it at that. But we're having a lot of fun getting to know this story on, on such a deep and intimate level because it is so much more. And it is important that each and every one of them are honored the way they should be. They are all part of the story. And, um, and they didn't all just live in Fort Pierce, too. They lived throughout the state of Florida. So it brings even more uh, geography into the story, too, which I think is pretty cool. And like everything else these days, COVID-19 has played a major role in your schedule. So talk about some of the pandemic-related issues that you guys have come across as you ramp up production. Yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been a nightmare, man, I got to tell you. Um, it, well, you know, I, I, I say that, but again, um, you know, COVID definitely has added additional costs to the budget that we didn't count on, you know, as far as being compliant and making sure everyone's safe and secure on set. Um, it's allowed us to get back into the script, do a final polish. We brought a couple uh, amazing writers on board to do a, a final polish on the script. Um, it's allowed us to kickstart and roll cameras on the documentary. So, um, you know, in a lot of ways, the delays have been a blessing, but, um, you know, it's certainly a huge concern as far as crew safety and cast safety and when we can actually, you know, get started on, on phase one production of, of the High Women feature film. So, um, so we've had to take a lot of things into account and a lot of it's been driven by what the guidelines and parameters are being set by Film Florida, but also um, Screen Actors Guild, SAG-AFTRA, and um, what, you know, a lot of the union requirements are. So we're really trying to just 
take a good look or, you know, full 360 degree look at everything, what's going on and whatnot. And, and you know, at first we were going to be one of the first productions out of the gate, but fortunately, um, you know, there've been a few others uh, that have pioneered just ahead of us. And um, it's been good to watch and see, you know, how COVID's affected their day and, and, you know, did, did it bring any delays or were they able to make their numbers and, and, and get all the pages they wanted to get shot, shot. And, and, you know, so far so good, but I, I really think that, is a great testament to Florida crew and the professionalism here that, you know, I, I, I live and breathe every single day, you know, with everybody, they're just amazing people that work here. And, you know, it, it just because their hearts in the right place. I mean, they all just want to work and, 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 and tell great stories, whether it's a commercial or a film or a short film or whatever. And, and so, it, you know, I, I think no matter what's going on out there, as far as pandemics or setbacks, I, I just know that we've got great resources and talent here to, um, to see it through. And what's the long-term schedule for the highwaymen? Um, well, again, it, it's, it's kind of a two pronged project. So the documentary series um, it is approximately a, a 40 day shoot, right, Joy? It's about 40 days in the budget, um, which, you know, accounts for all the interviews we want to do and B roll shots and things like that. And then I think we're into like a 52 week edit schedule from there. So financially we've broken the project up um, two different phases. And phase one will be about 50% of the script, which we'll uh, be rolling cameras on uh, sometime November, December of 2020. And then we'll get into uh, phase two, which are all the 1960 scenes in the script. And um, that'll be hopefully first quarter of 2021, you know, depending again on outside factors like the pandemic and whatnot. So. And, and Joyce, so we have a little bit of time before we actually see final product for if people want to learn more about the highwaymen, where do you recommend that they go? I mean, where have you where have you gotten a lot of your research from? You know, if you Google the Florida highwaymen, don't Google the highwaymen, Google Florida highwaymen. There's a, a lot of resources online. And then even on Facebook, there's the, you know, the highwaymen Facebook page um, is a great way to be connected to the progress in our production. Uh, because as Todd mentioned, we have been able to actually be in production for the documentary. So we've got really fun updates constantly coming out on that. Um, but as far as the actual Highwaymen is concerned, it's an easy Google search. Um, there are a lot of resources out there. And I actually don't want to say one in particular because they're all totally different. But there's a lot of sites. Also, because they're art, there are a lot of artist sites where, yes, you can learn about the artists and you can learn about where they came from and their kids and what they're doing and if they're still alive and that. But there are some of them um, who are still living, by the way, there are 10 of them still living. There are sites dedicated just to selling the art. So you don't just learn about them. You can also see the, the pieces that are currently for sale, which is pretty cool. It would be a bad idea to buy one now, too. No, it wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> now Not is the time. <laughs> so, Todd, as we've talked about, this is a really important Florida story. So is there a way for the, the state of Florida and, and you know, our citizens to get involved and get engaged in, the, in this process? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of our you know commitments is to... Not, not just to shoot this film in Florida, which was, you know, part of our 15 year journey to make sure that we shot the highwaymen in Florida instead of, um, you know, any neighboring states, but, um, you know, to also reach out and encourage community involvement. So we're doing certain things on the production side, such as, um, you know, especially during phase one production, we'll be shooting in and around central Florida, uh, focusing on, you know, the greater downtown area, such as areas like Paramore and Washington Heights and whatnot. Um, we want to do a ton of community outreach, reaching out and getting our craft services, you know, getting catering to the local restaurants and, you know, mentorship opportunities through Junior Achievement, for example, or the programs they've got going on down there where kids can come and, you know, really watch and learn and, and become inspired by, you know, what it takes to make a movie, basically. But, um, you know, we, we're, on, we're on Facebook, as Joy mentioned earlier, um, the starsnorth.com website. There's a, there's a presence for highwaymen. And um, we'll do everything from crewing up our, our production team to casting the film. So um, there's opportunities for everyone to really get involved and reach out. And we, uh, we encourage it. Regarding casting for this, there's been, um, I've had several people reach out to me about getting involved from a casting perspective as far as being in the film as an extra, but maybe they have a group of people who it's, you know, a church group who is interested in theater and that kind of thing, but they'd love to be a part of it. And they're part of this community. 
in case anyone is interested in that kind of thing, reaching out to us and letting us know will help us flag those opportunities for our background talent folks that we're working with to cast those scenes. Um, because again, we do want the community involved as much as possible. And um, this is a local story and, and having the local community be a part of it is important to us as a crew. And, and Joy, besides the, the one gentleman we spoke about earlier, is there one story out there that really just kind of grabs you that's like your personal favorite at this point? Oh, man. You know, I have to say there's, um, it's not a complete answer to your question because I am in love with so many of them. I mean, the last year of my life has been dedicated to researching these folks and I love bits and pieces and I love portion. I, I love so many, but there have been a few that I have met, you know, in these interviews. And I have to tell you one in particular um, is Willie Daniels. And that was just one of the most special interviews that I had. Um, he is just an incredible artist. He's one of the originals and he is a beautiful artist to this day. And just to sit and, and talk with him is um, it's one of the blessings of my life at this point, really. I really appreciate you taking time out of your production schedule to talk with us today, Joy and Todd. We really appreciate you telling this great Florida story, and we really appreciate you being on the Film Florida podcast. Uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for having us. It was a pleasure. Very much so. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Film Florida podcast. For more information about Film Florida, go to filmflorida.org or visit our social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out the Film Florida merchandise at teespring.com slash stores slash Film Florida. And please remember to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast.